Hello and welcome to our weekly Facebook live stream, Get to Know the HPO. My name is Abigail Richardson Schulte and I am composer in residence with the HPO. Well, today we have a really fun day. We have Mary J joining us. Mary plays second trumpet with the HPO and uh, we've got a lot of music to listen to and also a fun quiz of orchestral excerpts right at the end. So get ready for that. But welcome, Mary. Great to have you with us. Thank you. I'm very glad that this worked out and I was able to do it. Yeah. Now, I, I understand you've been with the HPO for quite a long time. Can you tell us about uh, your years in the HPO? Uh, yes, I joined the orchestra in the late 80s. Uh, there was an opening for a second trumpet. Um, so I did that and I won that audition. And that year was uh, Boris's, Boris Bratz's final year in the orchestra. So I did several years uh, playing second trumpet and when the orchestra went through its uh, little downfall there in 1995, um, when it came back, um, the then principal trumpet player had moved on to Symphony Nova Scotia. So for several years after that, I played principal trumpet and then about 15 years ago, I had an injury, so I was able to go back um, and the phone calls come in here. Anyway, yes. then uh, after the injury, I went back playing second trumpet and have been in that position for the past uh, 15 years. Okay, and uh, can you tell us about uh, some of the highlights for you in the last 30 years? Well, uh, I was thinking about that because I <laughs> thought this question might come up. Yeah. Uh, in the early years, uh, it was a full-time orchestra, meaning, you know, we had a 38-week season full of concerts every week, uh, small ensembles going out into the schools uh, weekly, daily. Um, the highlights, I think, were certainly for me the years that Opera Hamilton was in existence and we did the collaborations with them. It, it, at the time, it, it was a big deal in Hamilton um, to do those productions. It was, it was world class. The conductor was world class. Um, to do those, uh, that, that was fantastic. Uh, very early on, I believe in 92, there was a touring production of Les Mis that came through Hamilton and did a three week residency in the uh, uh, Great Hall. And uh, so the orchestra was hired to do that. And I just love doing that three weeks of Les Mis and those songs mm -hmm. still resonate with me. Um, there was also a time when the Royal Winnipeg Ballet was touring. So they hired the orchestra to do uh, a number of performances of Romeo and Juliet. So those collaborations were certainly uh, amazing. And even the years we collaborated with the local um, ballet and when the Cuban National Ballet came and were our principals. Um, and the funny story there was that here we have this uh, Cuban National Ballet come and that's when we got the biggest snowstorm that we've had in years. <laughs> 50 centimeters of snow and those Cubans had never seen snow before. So that was a really fun thing. Um, Pavarotti came. A couple of times the first the first time he came uh we got to the concert and about a half hour before the downbeat and this was going to be at cops coliseum that the, the then cops coliseum you know he he was having vocal issues so that concert was cancelled mm. and he came back again same thing got to just about the downbeat and he cancelled um but that was the during those years i was playing principal trumpet and uh we did the o solo mia and that starts with a sort of a trumpet solo trumpet duet and Pavarotti sat over there and gave me the thumbs up. So. I oh, figured. wow. That's great. <laughs> um, also, you know, with the collaborations uh, at the pop shows, the first time I heard the Hamilton children's choir, heartbreaking, just absolutely stunning to be able to do those. Um, Canadian brass came probably three times over the years I've been there and to hear their virtuosity is just astounding. Um, and and the simple things uh, to hear Steve Sotarski play as our concertmaster 
is a true gift to be able to be part of that. Lovely. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a nice survey uh, from across the years. Um, and you mentioned the Canadian brass. I mean, uh, this past uh, November, we had the Canadian brass back again um, for their anniversary. And uh, it was a real treat to see our brass players uh, up on stage with them um, playing that, uh, playing little brass quintet with brass quintet. So that, that was very special too. Um, now uh, you, you've shown. I mean, some HPO did some some huge uh, co-productions uh, in the past. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what it is uh, now to play with the orchestra? I mean, how how many uh, concerts are you doing, and extra community work, things like that? The orchestra is a part-time orchestra, which for people who are full-time professional musicians, it is just one of the things that we do to make a living. Uh, there, are uh, there are probably a, a big concert every month. There are smaller concerts depending on ensembles. Uh, I play in the brass quintet, uh, obviously, I'm a brass mm -hmm. player. So we do a fair amount uh, during the Christmas season. So there's that. And the Brass Quintet often goes and does a lot of education concerts in schools, sort of throughout probably uh, an area within an hour circumference from Hamilton. We've been to, we've been to many rural uh, places. It's been really exciting. Mm -hmm. So uh, what else do you do uh, musically then besides playing with the HPO? So for me to round out uh, a full-time living, uh, I have over the years had a number of students. I've scaled that back a couple of years, sort of preparing for retirement, but teaching has been certainly part of what I do. Uh, the other big part of what I do and probably three quarters of my income is I play the musicals at the Stratford Festival. And mm -hmm. I've this season, which is unfortunately on pause, like most arts uh, organizations events. Um, this season, it would have been a production of Chicago, which uh, I was really excited for in that I've never played it before. I think I heard it once in Toronto, maybe 15 years ago. So we had just gotten through two rehearsals of that. We sort of had just run the book and then everything got shut down. So that was kind of disappointing. But for the past 24 years, that has been a huge part of my playing life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just to uh, update you with some comments here, we have a number of your colleagues saying hello, um, including uh, David Pell, who is our uh, principal trombone player with the orchestra. He says, hi, Mary and Abigail. Mary, I miss playing with you so much. Lovely. And then follows up, probably the most supportive colleague I've ever worked with. Well, isn't that lovely? Well, Dave, Dave makes everybody's job extraordinarily easy. And uh, the years that I was playing principal trumpet, we were sort of, uh, we had a little bit of a different setup. So the trombones typically sat behind the trumpets and uh, to have that sound and rock solid playing behind you certainly made my job extraordinarily fun and easy. <laughs> Dave, Dave is the best. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was just going to say for players and all of us certainly have other jobs. There's a number of players in the orchestra who play with the ballet. So there are a number who play with the opera. Um, I don't live in Toronto. I live in Waterloo. And as you know, my husband will be joining us who plays in the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony. Um, that is also one of the things that I do and have done consistently for the past 30 years is play as a regular extra with that orchestra. So that ends up being a significant amount of playing and work. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much rounds out what I do. You're busy. <laughs> now, uh, to go back to the Stratford Festival for a moment, uh, we have a question here from Pat Dickinson who asks, did we see Mary playing the trumpet at the Stratford Festival opening night online on Monday night? Ah, uh, yes, she did. Ah, yeah. very yes. observant, Pat. Uh, Monday night would have marked the, the opening, the big opening gala of the festival. And it's a huge event and it's and it's a it's a huge festival. And to mark the occasion that there is no festival happening this year and it's pretty devastating 
for the organization, it's devastating for the community. They decided to mark the occasion with a with a fanfare because there's fanfares typically at the beginning of every show. And it was quite uh, an affair because everything had to be distanced. And we were outdoors and being six feet apart was a fairly easy thing to do, but there was also the rehearsal, there was the warm up, there was the getting of the instruments and everything had to be six feet apart. And fortunately there was a lot of people on hand to make that happen. And so yes, we played the fanfare live and we also recorded it that was at the top of the live stream event that happened that the festival put on. Mm -hmm. It was pretty emotional. I bet. I First bet. time we played with people in 10 weeks. Mm. And of course, uh, you're you're quite uh, in a rare situation that you that you have played with somebody recently. Most musicians, of course, uh, aren't aren't able to do that. Um, now, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, playing at Stratford, since that makes up a substantial portion of your life? Uh, wh what what do you do there? The Stratford Festival typically has at least two musicals running uh one at each of those there's four theaters so there's one at each of the two large theaters this there was going to be a third musical at the brand new theater um so last year for example we did billy elliott in the big theater and we did little shop of horrors at the avon theater so that was my that was so you do four shows a, a week in one theater four shows a week in the other theater so it's a rep theater and you do uh you get to s split the shows. Um, also, for the non-musical productions, uh, the Shakespeare productions, they often have composers write music and the musicians are hired to record the music for those. Uh, this year there was going to be some on stage live music for Hamlet, which I would have been involved in. Um, but unfortunately that uh, uh, did not happen and hopefully it will happen next year. So it, it certainly varies year to year and it's certainly very busy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what about fanfares here? Uh, David Yeager, who was a uh, former producer of Two New Hours on CBC, um, he asks, uh, don't you love playing the Rimsky-Korsakov procession of the nobles, exclamation mark. I sure do. <laughs> anything, Great. anything that's big and brassy is uh, always extraordinarily fun for yeah. us to play. Now let's get to another topic you mentioned, education. How much uh, does that play a part of your life? When I first started uh, in the business, I played in a brass quintet that uh, was a professional brass quintet and we had developed a school show. So we started going into schools pretty early on and the Hamilton Brass Quintet also does that a lot, and I've done a lot with the Kitchener Brass Quintet. Mm. Um, so that has certainly been an introduction for a lot of these kids to what the instruments are, and we go in and we show them what the instruments are and how loud they play and how soft they play in the range. Um, my teaching studio has been primarily five to 15 year olds. So I've started a lot of beginners, which is really fun because they know nothing and you can form them and they don't develop habits that are really hard to break. Um, there was one particular program at the Hamilton Philharmonic that I've been involved in the last couple of years and it's an instrument for every child. And you might have the information as to who sponsors that program um, but grade ones in uh, the city core have the opportunity to choose an instrument. And so what I have done is gone into these schools and demonstrated the trumpet. And you have these little six-year-olds there that have never seen a trumpet before for the most part. They don't know whether it's a brass instrument or whether it's played loudly or softly. And so I go in and I'll, I'll, I play a little thing on the trumpet, which was the very first thing that when I was uh, choosing an instrument, it's what the band director played for me. So I go in and I play this very typical little trumpet thing. It's a fanfare. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and the kids go absolutely wild when they hear that. Um, typically, and of course they love the horse when he too, um, but typically these kids have also done stuff for me. And these are little grade oneers, and they come in and they sing the C major scale. And I'm playing it on a B flat trumpet for anybody who has perfect pitch. And they sing that and their music director guides them through that and guides them through. So what I like to play for them, and I said, well, if you know those notes of the scale and you start learning an instrument, you can make a lot of really beautiful music very, very early on, just by knowing a few notes. And I play this one little piece for them, which I'll play now. And something as simple as that, those kids are just, mm -hmm. it's quite, it's quite emotional to, to see that. But I, I have a one quick little story about one little kid in this program and his name was Rupert. And they all get to try, I bring a bugle and they all get to try the bugle and I bring a lot of mouthpieces and that <laughs> certainly wouldn't be able to happen now, would it? And they all get to put the, the mouthpiece in the, and just get the experience of what it, is like and there was this one little fellow there named Rupert couldn't do it not a chance and he got very upset with this and he went to the corner of the room and he was crying and you know me being a mother it's just like oh no this kid's gonna be destroyed so I said Rupert I don't let this happen very often but if you got to try my silver trumpet I think that this would work for you and I said because this trumpet is sort of a little bit more magical than just the basic bugle. So little Rupert came over and thank heavens, he took a big breath and was able to put his mouth in the mouthpiece and make the buzz. And honestly, that story sticks with me to the day that the effect this has on the kids because they don't get this like we do. We're exposed to it every day, but for these kids, it's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such an adorable story. Your, your, your magical trumpet, magical silver trumpet. Uh, yeah, a AFEC, uh, an instrument for every child, um, is a very well-known organization in Hamilton run by the uh, Hamilton Music Collective. And it was uh, one of the original members of El Sistema Canada, uh, you know, fantastic organization. Uh, El Sistema started in, in Venezuela. And um, this is run by Astrid Hepner. And it, uh, I believe they have over 650 students across, I think, 16 inner city schools and uh, community centers. And it really gives uh, children who otherwise would not have any access to uh, music lessons the chance to do it. And as you say, they're for very little kids. I think the highest they go up to is uh, grade five. I think so, uh, when I was in Involved. Um, so yeah, we uh, certainly uh, help to push our musicians through the uh, the AFEC program. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a nice partnership and a great organization. Um, so can you tell us what was that piece you played? It was a piece out of uh, the Royal Conservatory put out a series of books probably five years ago, um, graded levels of the conservatory program, and this was from the absolute beginner book preparatory level and it was called lullaby by graham lyons and uh sometimes when i'm totally tired and exhausted and want to play beautiful music i just play something really really simple and then sometimes i just go and i kind of make up my own melodies to the to the background just for something to do great yeah um, now, uh, what have you been doing at home during this time, Mary, since you're not playing, well, very much uh, out publicly? Right. For the most part, musicians, we, we work a lot. 
and we're practicing and learning parts a lot when we go do our concerts our, or our shows, that's our workout. We pretty much a lot gets taken care of, but for the past 10 weeks, we haven't been rehearsing, we haven't been performing. And so you have to be, my, my goal is to stay in shape. And what that means for me is I play two practice sessions a day and I've been able to work on stuff that sometimes gets neglected. Uh, I get to work on stuff that I'm not really good at. And for in our household so far, we've been really, really dedicated to just keeping up, keeping up our level of playing. Um, so I do a really good warm up, probably right after lunch, probably 30, 40 minutes. And then at night, I really make an effort working on range, working on endurance. And I decided that I would do make an effort of becoming a little bit more uh, abled in the jazz, in the jazz oh. world. And that, and I'm a beginner, believe me. <laughs> so there's a book here. I've been, I've been working, there's a book called Patterns for Jazz. So I've been picking one of those every day and working through those. And um, so I have a little demo. And this is a, from a, a book by Michael Davis that wrote a bunch of etudes and there's various performers on them. This one is demoed by Randy Brecker and it's on flugelhorn. And so I'll, I'll just give a little, a little taste of this um, to try to be a good ballad player. <laughs> Great, Mary. Um, it's such a, a mellow and beautiful sound. Um, Erica Kay says, Mary, you sound bloody fantastic. I know Erica Kay. That's <laughs> really Erica, hi. She's in, over in England, I believe. Um, there was a question previously just to talk about instruments, and I'll just meet briefly. That was on flugelhorn. I play a Yamaha flugelhorn. Um, there are a number of etudes in this series. Uh, by Michael Davis, and there's a few jazz ones, and I work on these on and off, and they're really, really, really fun to play, and to, especially when you're alone in your basement and not embarrassing yourself too much. Um, the other thing, I just had one more little, little bit of a demo I'm going to play. Um, okay, just a, a question while you're setting up there, Mary. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to me that you're, you're playing jazz, and, and I love it. Um, I, I think that jazz is a big part of uh, high school students, uh, trumpet players' lives, right? And then probably they get into university if they're going the classical route. And then my guess is they don't get that much of an opportunity to play it anymore, except perhaps in pops shows. Uh, is, is that the case? That has certainly been the case for me. Um, and yes, orchestras, orchestras play a lot of pop shows. There is a lot of that type of playing that you have to step up to the plate and be able to do. Also the shows in Stratford, um, there's been a number of swing shows that we've done over the years that it certainly helps to be able to have a little bit of a ability to sound like a non-legit player. And they certainly uh, bring in lead players who are qualified to in that style. Uh, 
for years, Steve McDade played uh, lead on a number of the big band swing shows, which certainly set the standard for the style. And that was incredibly awesome. Right. Yeah, those uh, some of those pop shows are amazing. I mean, the, the trumpet work is just seems to me as a listener to be incredibly difficult and, and so high and taxing for so long. It, uh, it's uh, a really uh, a special skill. Uh, just to uh, ad update you here, a few more comments for you. Vivian Lee says, sounds amazing, Mary. Stephanie Laporte says, amazing, Mary. And uh, David Yeager says, Sally says you make your instrument tell a story. Thank you. So aren't those lovely? Well, keep, keep it up with the jazz. I think that's the message for you. It's really, it's really fun. And uh, I'll say hi to Vivian. She's a trombone player in the Montreal Symphony. And oh, and we're having cocktails with her tonight. Oh. And I believe, am I correct, that Vivian played a season in the Hamilton Philharmonic too? Yeah. Yes, she did. Yes. Um, so the other thing I'm doing to play, and we're sort of limited, is, you know, I can play etudes, I can play technical stuff on the trumpet, but sometimes it's just nice to play music. And I had mentioned earlier that the um, conservatory came out with some series of books. And this is one I'm going to play just a little bit from, and this is from the level seven book. And it's just, again, a beautiful piece of music. And it is classical music on C trumpet. And what was that? That was, oh, you're going to test my Italian. <laughs> Nacia Ciao Pianga from Handel. It's uh, by uh, Handel. Right. And so from, from the opera Rinaldo. Now, is it common for uh, trumpet players to uh, play soprano arias? Uh, very common. We love to do that. Uh, it's really important to try to sing through your instrument and to sometimes imitate uh, lyrical, beautiful vocal uh, lines is certainly what we try to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, we have uh, Vivian Lee responded and said uh, she played four seasons with the HPO. And uh, Heather Wooten, who's out in Calgary, who says, great to be able to hear you out in Calgary, uh, used to play with the HPO uh, with Mary too. So uh, that, that's fun. It's nice to see your, your former colleagues chime in here. See, that's the beauty of social media. You put it out there and uh, your friends come on and say hi. Isn't this fun? Um, so Mary, maybe you can tell us about your musical family members. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's one. <laughs> They'll be joining us in a second. Uh, I have, we have two children. My son is 24. He just graduated two years ago from Humber and he's a, a bass player. So he plays commercial electric and upright bass and his uh, goal is to be a theater player. And he was contracted to play a season at Stratford doing spam a lot this season and unfortunately as are the rest of us he's on hold too. Uh, my daughter who's 27 graduated from the Sheridan, Sheridan theater musical theater program and so she does musical theater throughout southern Ontario. She's based in Toronto and uh, she was en route halfway through New York State to showcase a new musical there. When they got the call, turn around, come back. And mm. so her career's on hold right now too. So it's 
it certainly hurt hurt this family hard as many of our HPO families who are have spouses in the business and we're all pretty much shut down. Of but, course. So, so well, your whole family you. then, your whole family are, are musicians. And and by the way, uh, your son says, uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's him. That's him. But also, as everybody uh, is waiting uh, impatiently for, my husband is also a trumpet player. He is going to join us right now. And Woo! we're going to... We're going to play a couple of little things and then we're going to do our excerpt thing because when you live with a trumpet player, <laughs> the potential is just so uh, large in what you can what you can do. Now I think okay. I've lost my. Uh, so uh, hi, hi, Larry. Uh, welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is this is Larry Larson. And now, Larry, you used to play uh, principal trumpet with uh, the HBO for a couple of years in the '90s, right? I did. I was principal trumpet, uh, acting principal trumpet '91, '92, and then principal trumpet '92, '93. Uh -huh. Aha! Right, now maybe you can give us the uh, Cole's Notes version of uh, what you did after you left the HBO. Well, um, uh, the the year that uh, that I left in '93, the uh, the orchestra was starting to go through some very very difficult financial times, and it looked like it might not survive. So at the exact same time, the principal trumpet job in Kitchener Waterloo Symphony came open, mm -hmm. and so it, it made sense for me to to at least audition for that job so that uh, we wouldn't be both in the same situation should things go under. Fortunately, I won the job in Kitchener. And uh, which turned out to be fortuitous because things did, of course, go sideways with the orchestra in Hamilton back uh, back just around that time. So, uh, but I've been back a number of times to play extra and uh, guest principal trumpet a, a few times. So, uh, mm -hmm. and then of course with with my lovely wife here, it's it's always nice to to go and play. It's fun to play. I mean, I've been a principal trumpet player my entire career, but I love playing section trumpet. So. Mike Fedition has had me in a number of times to play uh, third or fourth trumpet in the orchestra, and that's just so much fun. And Mike's, Mike's a great leader, and it's it's fun to to grab onto someone else's coattails and and uh, and play in that situation. Great, and uh, and and we've also seen you uh, front and center on, on some of our pops uh, concerts, like the movie uh, uh, shows. I think in 2013 and 2015. Yeah. As well, yeah. So you're 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 still part of the family. <laughs> yeah, my best friend Dave Martin, who's a trombone player in, in Montreal. Uh, we've known each other since my my very first concert in, in Canada in 1987. Uh, we've done ten pop shows that we've produced, and uh, fortunately, brought you know that we've done them all in Kitchener, but uh, fortunately, Hamilton had us in for two shows too, and that was just such such fun. Mm hmm. So uh, I have to ask two two professional trumpet players in the same house. How does that work? <laughs> Actually, beautifully. Um, yeah. Our house is fairly large. We have okay. three floors and the studios in the basement. And uh, Larry practices a lot in the studio. I typically practice in this area because it's large and uh, it's easier to sound good in a, in, in the large space. Um, but my kids grow up, and they certainly know all the all the trumpet warm up licks. <laughs> <laughs> they know that. They know basically every trumpet lick. They know all the excerpts. They they uh, that's that's part of the part of life around here. But uh, it's a good time. Yeah. We have a piece we're going to play. We're just going to play little snippets of this. This is something that we've done throughout the years. It's a canonic. Uh, from Kinetic Sonata. What is important is that basically whatever Larry plays, I play a, a, mm -hmm. a bar later, and just the effect is uh, pretty astounding. That was uh, Telemann, yes? Yes. And that, and that etude goes on for uh, uh, quite a while, and it's a really fun thing. And it's a nice thing for students because it can be played really slowly. It doesn't have to be. It can be played on B-flat trumpet. We both played it on C trumpet there. Um, but we, we love playing that, and that is sort of one of our go-to pieces. 
Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in, in our survey in advance, uh, Kevin Bordeaux asks, what model of trumpet do you play and which mouthpiece do you use? So it'd be great uh, if both of you could answer that. We trumpet nerds love to talk about equipment and I, I'll, I'll talk nonstop about it. So um, I'm playing a, a Bach Stradivarius C trumpet, the new artisan model. And I'm also playing a Bach trumpet, a little bit of an older model. And typically I play a Bach 3C trumpet for the majority of the things I do. And I use uh, GR mouthpieces. There are uh, Gary Radke is a mouthpiece maker in Wisconsin. And I think, I think my collection now is up to 14 of them <laughs> for the various horns I play. And uh, um, yeah, that's, that's for that. And then our next, but the next horns we're using. So we're going to play just a little bit of the Vivaldi uh, concerto for two trumpets. Um, we're playing them on B flat piccolo trumpets today, mainly because we found an accompaniment, accompaniment online that was in B flat. Um, mine is a Yamaha, and I play a GR mouthpiece on this. And I've got a Bach Artisan piccolo trumpet again, and uh, I've got to give you a close up of this mouthpiece, trumpet players. This is just a Bach, can you see? Let's see. That's just a Bach 7C mouthpiece that I've had what's called skeletonized. So basically the, all the extra metal is shaved off the sides to give a little extra response, like in the higher register, especially. So I've, I've played this guy for almost 40 years. So this is uh, the first movement of the, of the Vivaldi concerto for two trumpets. And our son has just asked the question, does it, do you know anything else on piccolo? <laughs> <laughs> so I had sort of, no. I had prompted him to ask, oh, Larry, play the Brandenburg. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, that's uh, so nice to hear piccolo trumpets. Um, Tom uh, Bolesky says, Penny Lane solo, please. <laughs> uh, a neighbor of ours, just literally down the street. And uh, and he's also a trumpet player. He's also a very ah. good trumpet player. And, and Tom, I, I don't have my A shank with me, sorry. We'll play it on B flat. <laughs> Um, great. Now, uh, a question for you. Are trumpet players expected to know how to play all of the different trumpets? Uh, and, uh, you know, and flugelhorn and piccolo trumpet and B flat trumpet and C trumpet. Is that expected? Yeah. Pretty, I mean, if you're going to get to a professional level, you really, you really need all those animals for orchestral work. I mean, we, on piccolo trumpet, we will do, you know, you do Messiah every year, um, B minor mass of Bach, Magnificat, uh, and flugelhorn often often shows up on, on pop shows as well. So it's it's nice to have everything at the, in your arsenal. E flat trumpet as well is another one that um, occasionally shows up in trumpet. I've I've been using a, a, a large bore E flat trumpet lately on a lot of classical repertoire, uh, just for a, a bit lighter sound. Can you just explain uh, in layman's terms to our audience that might not be familiar with uh, the keys of different trumpets, uh, what that means and why you would have to play uh, in trumpets with different keys? Sure. The, the standard trumpet that everyone learns on is the there we go, B flat trumpet. And uh, if you then see the C trumpet is basically just a, a, a bit shorter bit of tubing uh, so that it plays a, a full step higher than the B flat trumpet. And B flat means that if I play the lowest open note, 
That sounds a concert B flat. If Larry played the lowest open note on the C trumpet, it sounds a concert C. And the same with the E flat trumpet. If you play the lowest open note, it'll sound an E flat. Yeah. And, and typically it's, I mean, German orchestras and European orchestras for years used B flat trumpet for everything. And it was the French orchestras that started playing the smaller horns. They would play, play, they would play the C trumpet. And that moved over to, the, to North America when uh, Cheryl Munch was the music director of the Boston Symphony. And when he came, he brought a lot of his friends from the French orchestras to teach at the conservatory. And so those French trumpet teachers came over and brought their C trumpets and his, their students started playing C trumpet. So you can thank the French trumpet players for the tradition of C trumpet now being basically the standard in North American orchestras. Right, and, and I certainly appreciate that as a composer, that if I write a C, a C will come out. Otherwise, with a B flat trumpet, you write a C and a B flat will come out. So everything, all of the music has to be transposed higher. Uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, so same thing with clarinets, for instance. So yeah, it's, it's something uh, we have to adjust to. Um, now, uh, oh, a, a, another, uh, a few, few comments for you. Uh, Andy Molnar, love you guys. So we, we've got a lot of trumpet players watching you here. <laughs> and uh, But I understand you're going to do a quiz for us. Now, the trick is, trumpet players especially shouldn't, shouldn't answer. Don't give the answer away. Um, and, and, you know, professional musicians in general, please don't give the answer away. Let's give a chance for some other people to answer at the beginning. And then uh, after, if nobody answers, then we'll let you do it. So uh, we have a number of excerpts. So. And and yes. David Yeager too. Dave, David Yeager too. Yeah, I would count him as a pro musician. So pro musicians, hang back until we say you can answer. All right, let's let's have our first excerpt. Great. No, nobody has answered so far. So let's give five seconds until we open it up to the pros. <laughs> All right, go. <laughs> what was that? Let's see your answers. I feel like we need the Jeopardy theme song now. Oh, Pat Dickinson says Prince of Denmark March, question mark. I think, uh, see, Kathy Stone might know who that, what that is, and Andras Molnar might know what that is. Uh, we have a guest here from Larry Pakin, Mendelssohn. No. Hi, Larry. How are you? Nice to see you. Um, you and, and our HPO personnel okay. manager and operations oh. manager and second horn, last oh. movement of Beethoven 5. Neil, Neil for Neil. the win. Thanks, Neil. Now we, now we can move on. Okay. <laughs> Excerpt number two. Let's go for it. Okay, so let's open it up first to non-professional players. Now is your chance. Oh, and by the way, we had a few more people um, chime in who also got Beethoven 5, uh, Andy Molnar and Linda Umbrico. Yeah. Okay, and uh, now we have our first answer, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique from Vivian Lee. Yay, Vivian. Yay, and also Andy Molnar. Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, great. So let's have our uh, 
our excerpt number three. And remember, for all of you pros, let's just hang back a little bit first. We have an early answer here from Tom Smee, who writes oh, Mahler go. One. Way to go, Tom. How are you? Okay, what movement? <laughs> ah. <laughs> this is getting hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, do we have any answers there? Anyone else can answer what movement of Mahler One was that? Any pros, jump in. Come on, Neil. <laughs> oh, it's not happening. Okay, I think you're gonna. Tom Smee might have done some uh, some work with the HBO Neil, back in the day. Neil comes in. Neil got it again. Neil, Neil's Neil's looking like our our winner for the day here. It's uh oh, we have a few more guesses here. Vivian Lee, second movement. Andy nope. Molnar, Mahler, third movement. So Andy got it again. A Andy, you gotta be a little quicker off the mark though if you're gonna beat Neil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's go for our fourth movement, our fourth excerpt. <laughs> Okay, and first, let's go for non-pros, see if we have any answers here. Not yet, all right, let's open it up to the pros. <laughs> Linda writes, really hard clarinet and piccolo part coming up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Linda's husband is a principal clarinet in our orchestra, so she knows. Okay, Tchaikovsky, Andras Molna writes Tchaikovsky. Yes, correct, but what Tchaikovsky? Oh, Neil, Tchaikovsky oh, for oh, third Neil. movement. <laughs> All right, he's doing well, eh? Yeah, we got oh, oh, we have a few more here. Uh, Heather Wooten, third yeah. movement, yep. and uh, Tchaikovsky four. Yep, she was also right. And oh, Kathy Stone, Tchaikovsky four. I might not be able to get these too. I, I, I know I played them. I might not be able to get them. <laughs> Answer there from Tom Smee, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Absolutely. I love that. It's so quirky. Mm, great. And yeah. Larry and I did play that together when he was with the Hamilton Philharmonic. Yeah. Uh, Victor Felgrill was conducting. That's right. Uh, and I don't think I've played it 
set. Ooh. All right, we have one more with uh, two trumpets and then we have one with three trumpets. This one should be easy too. Okay, and for the pros, any guesses here from our non-professional musicians and trumpet players? Oh, David Yeager says, thank you, Abby, for such a fun segment. Well, thank you, David, we appreciate that. And thank you, Mary and Larry, this has been really fun. Okay, oh, Andras Molnar says, Dvorak 8. There we and, go. And, and where in Dvorak 8 is that? Big trumpet moment, big. Big trumpet moment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Vivian Lee also says Dvorak 8. Oh, and by the way, we also had some correct answers for the previous one. Uh, Vivian Lee and Andras Molnar also got them. They're just a little slower responding. Uh, Vivian Lee says opening of Dvorak 8. Oh, fourth movement. Last movement. Fourth movement. Yep. Andrash Molnar says last movement. Neil Spaulding says last movement. There we are. All right. So uh, what's next? One, one fun thing about that excerpt is when we've done it in uh, the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony, probably three or four times in my 27 years here, uh, the first rehearsal, my second trumpet player, Dan Warren, and I often conspire against the conductor just for fun and play it either up or down a half step <laughs> when we're starting, just to see if, first of all, if they hear it and then to see. That you know, if, if it's someone that we know and, and will appreciate the joke, then when the, the cellos come in with the first melody, <laughs> you, you're you're such brass players. Only brass players could get away with that. No. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see that. That's funny. We have uh, one more piece of music uh, excerpt. It's a uh, one of the most beautiful moments ever uh, written in music. Uh, and it's a three trumpet excerpt. So since my daughter is presently here during the pandemic, she's going to come and join us for this. Can you, can Hi, you Laura. Can you see Hello. her? Hello. This is my daughter, Laura. Hi. Our daughter, Laura. So we're going to do this last piece. Yeah. Perfect. Wait, wait. Sorry. Oh. Uh, she needs a C trumpet. Sorry. Oh, sorry. That's B flat. That. Certainly can happen. Do you have a seat? I do. There you go. My bad. Wow. That would that would have been awkward. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. I don't actually play the trumpet. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh you, you take that. But you're a singer, right? Yeah. Well uh, let's uh we could probably do this vocally. Let's let's try no, let's, let's try singing it. Get in there too. <laughs> I can't play at all. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun doing that. Um, we tried to do it at pitch, but that made the made it really high for Larry. Seeing, even singing the third part. I'm fine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it made it fairly high vocally for Laura, so it goes up to a high G. So anyway, we we took it down significantly to make that work for everybody's voice. Um, so, okay, there's the answer. And and Andrash got it. Oh, yeah, got it. Brahms Academic Overture. Yep, and Linda Brahms and Vivian Sweet Brahms. Exactly. 
and uh, a, a lot of uh, positive comments here for your for your singing there. Uh, Ken McDonald says, uh, you need a horn now. I guess that's to you, Laura. <laughs> All right. Well, that was so much fun. Um, Heather says, I remember you guys singing lullabies in harmony to Laura when she was a baby and you came to visit us at the cottage. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, well, uh, such uh, such enthusiastic support for all of you. Um, and uh, so nice to see a lot of your friends and colleagues watching. So this is last chance to uh, ask any questions or give comments to uh, Mary, Larry, and Laura here. Um, although we'll continue to watch your comments as they come in. Um, oh, Andras Molnar, can you do it with uh, sulfa, with sulfage? Absolutely. <laughs> a good start all right well uh this was wonderful thank you so much all of you and uh and thank you especially mary for uh for uh being part of this whole interview very nicely done and uh and so nice to hear you uh playing solo as well so uh that that was lovely um, now, for the rest of you, I do hope you'll join next week. We have Suhashni Arulanandam, who plays second violin with the orchestra, and uh, we'll have a chance for you to ask some questions in advance uh, to Suhashni, and be sure to join us next week. Thanks for being here. Thanks again to Mary and her wonderful family. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, goodbye, everybody.